Welcome to this workshop and I'd like to uh, guide you through the process of creating a Figma account and what uh, is going to happen as soon as you click on create account and all that stuff. So uh, I've just went through the process of clicking on sign up and then choosing Google to sign up with. And as soon as you, you uh, have, have acknowledged all these sign up things on your phone, then you can now um, start continuing the sign up process. So my name is Matthijs Mali. Um, let's say I do design. I do not want Figma's mailing list and I create an account. It will start thinking for a little while and then it will refer you to your um, like Figma home screen. So that is where you enter and where you come in. So a short tutorial will pop up. You can choose to follow this, uh, but for now we will just click the cross and uh, see uh, what is on the page here. So on the left, you will have an overview of all the projects and teams that you're going to be working with. It will by default show you your recent, fi recent files that you've been working on. Um, uh, so let's first create a new team so we can start uh, on this uh, workshop. So we click on the button new team here and we'll just call it the recipe team since that what we are uh, that is what we are going to make click create team and your team will now be cre created uh, if you are collaborating with multiple people you can add their email addresses and they will be uh, send an email or be invited to your workspace right right away we will skip that for now and then we have to choose our plan since we are just trying out the software right now i think it's very good to just go for the free one but as soon as you start really actively collaborating, it's a very good choice to go for the professional plan. So let's pick choose starter. And another tutorial pop-up will uh, be shown right away. We will close that for now. And as you can see, we now have a team on the left side here and we can see the members that are in there. So in this case, it's just me. And let's create a new project within this uh, team in order to get started. So let's call the project the recipe app and click create project. Now we have created our first project and uh, Figma is uh, immediately trying to help us again by showing this tutorial. Let's close that for now as well. So within this recipe team, we now have a project called recipe app and we can import files, but we can also create a new one from scratch. So if we just click new file, a new file will be created that we can start working on. And that is what we will be doing in the next lesson. So you have your Figma account all set up and now it's time to create our first file. So if you have your teams and projects ready, you can now open the project within that specific team on the left side. And as you see, there are no files here yet. You can import your files here, but we can also click on new file in the top right corner. As soon as we do that, you will see that a new page is loaded where you can now start creating your uh, art. Uh, I will quickly go through all the different parts of this screen. So on the top you will have the toolbar uh, where you have a basic menu item where you can uh, go through all sorts of settings. Uh, in reality you will hardly ever use this. Then there's the uh, different selection tools that you have. Uh, there's the frame tooling, uh, also known as art artboards in, for example, Illustrator. Uh, then there are the shape tools which allow you to make uh, rectangles or lines or ellipses, polygons, etc. There is the pen tool, there's the text tool, and then there's also the comments tool. And on the top right, we have our uh, own avatar, our icon, uh, a share button with which we can uh, allow others to see the artboard that we, uh, that we created, a play button to start preview, previewing our prototype, some zoom options as well. Then on the left side here, we have a pane in which our layers will show up later. Uh, we can also switch that to an assets view. Uh, it's like a different tab. And here you have an overview of all the components that have been made. The center area over here is the area where we will start creating our design. And on the right side, we have a panel which is uh, containing three different tabs, design, prototype and code. The design tab is primarily used to set properties for all different shapes and art that you've been making. The prototyping tab will be used in order to in make your uh, designs interactive and the coding tab will uh, allow you to quickly see the CSS code or for example, the Android code for uh, the design that you have been creating. 
if at any point you find yourself lost or something, there's also a question mark on the bottom right, which you can click to quickly get to some help and resources. We have our new file ready. We can now start adding some designs into that. And in order to do that, we first need a sort of clean sheet of paper on which to work, and that is called the artboard. So if you press the letter A on your keyboard, you will enter the frame mode or the artboard mode where you can create a new artboard. On the right side, you see there are some defaults that will pop up that you can use in order to create your artboard. For example, if you click iPhone 8, you will see there is immediately a size iPhone 8 artboard on your screen. For now, let's delete this uh, and create one uh, of our own dimensions. So let's just click and drag until we have uh, a nicely sized artboard. A good thing to do right away is to rename the artboard to what you are going to make. So for this one, we can double click on the title of the artboard. And as you can see, the text is now selected here. You can also press Command R or Control R in order to get into rename mode. So for now, let's just call it text. It doesn't really matter what you call it, but it's good for you to know that these options are there. Next, what we are going to do, we're going to put some very basic shapes on top of that. So let's get to the shape tool, choose rectangle and click and drag in order to make this rectangle appear on the screen. Let's also add a little ellipse here and click and drag and make sure to do it on the right side of the rectangle. Otherwise, you will miss what I'm going to point out. So you'll see that when you click and drag, it becomes sort of elliptic. And what we want, we want it to be perfectly circular. So we hold the shift key while we click and drag, and then we let go, and then we have a perfectly dimensioned circle. These shapes can be given different properties. So on the right side, there's a property area where you can see I now have the circle selected, and the circle is 128 by 128 pixels. Let's do some basic settings for now. So let's change the color. So as we see here, we can set the color to, for example, red. We can drag the U slider around here and make it green. If we click outside of this area or click on the cross, the uh, settings will be applied and we can go change the color for our rectangle. Uh, what we can do here, for example, is set the color, but not choose a solid color, but choose a linear gradient, which usually makes scenes more appealing. So if we click here, uh, we can now choose radial or linear. So let's go with linear for now. And as you can see, a gradient is immediately applied. We can change all the different steps within that gradient. So we can add steps in between and say here it should be red. And here, for example, it should be more yellowish. So that's how we can create this gradient up there. As you can see, it like fades into this transparent matter. That happens because at the end here, we have one set to 0% transparency. It's also being auto adjusted for the other one. So make sure if you're making a gradient that you always have the right transparency set for your image. Uh, then what we can do with these shapes, we can align them together. So if we click on the uh, rectangle that we made, for example, we can now use the alignment tools at the top in order to align them. So we can left align this one, center, right, top, middle, or bottom. For now, let's do a center and center. So we have a perfectly aligned uh, uh, rectangle there. For the circle, we will do the same. We will also align it to the center. And now we have a nice sort of weird flag going on here. Um, now what we're going to do, we're going to do some very basic Boolean operations, which means that we are going to combine these two shapes. So now we have just a circle selected. And if we hold the shift key and click on the rectangle, you will see that we now have both layers selected, as you can see here. And also a new uh, option appeared on the top right here. These are the Boolean operations, and this allows us to combine different shapes into a new shape. So for now, let's uh, go through them quickly. So we have union, which basically means these shapes will be put together into one new big shape. Subtract, which means the layer on top will be removed from the layer on the bottom. Intersect, which means the intersection will be kept. And exclude, which means the intersection will be excluded. So for now, let's choose subtract. And we'll see that the circle has been removed. Same goes for the color because it's been removed from the rectangle, of course. And we now have a new shape that we can use in our design. On top of that, we can still access the original circle that was below that. 
So if we go to our layers panel on the left and we open the layer here, we'll see that the circle is still here. So if we click the circle and move the circle around, we can still uh, edit this shape while keeping the uh, single layer nature of the uh, Boolean operated shape. So we can still move this around. That is a very powerful feature to know. Uh, and you will be working with this uh, a lot, I think, in the, um, in the future. Now that we have our basic shape, it might be nice to add some little text to it. So we're going to move the shape a bit to the left and press the T button or the uh, on the toolbar on top text to uh, create a new text area. Now to create some text, we can just click in the area anywhere we want and it will automatically create sort of an open space for a sentence that we can type. So if I type sentence here, uh, this blah, 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 uh, we will just have a sentence there. And um, when we click outside of that uh, text area again, it will be made into a layer that we see over here. Another thing we can also do is we can create by clicking and dragging an area where we uh, will automatically, when we come to the uh, uh, end of the line, it will automatically jump to a next uh, paragraph. This might be useful when you are going to create text that has to be contained within a specific box, for example. And uh, now when we have a text layer, we can do various things with it. So we can uh, set, for example, the font weight. We can say it has to be bold. We can increase the size, decrease the size over here. We can, of course, click the arrow. But a quicker thing to usually do is just select the size and then hold shift and press the up arrow in order to increase it by steps of 10 or decrease it by steps of 10. Um, so then we have a nice piece of text. Uh, we can align it, of course. Uh, horizontally on the right on the left and all that but as you can see with the uh, the text area that I made here when I center it it doesn't really change because the text box was actually sizing while I was typing whereas with this one if I would center it it is now properly centered or aligned to the right that is an important thing to know of course there are some more settings here that allow you to do very uh, advanced uh, text um, editing, but that is not important for uh, this uh, quick tutorial. Uh, more important is the amount of fonts that we have within Figma. So Figma allows us uh, direct access to all the fonts in the Google Fonts library. So if we open uh, fonts.google.com, we'll now find an enormous amount of fonts that are available to us uh, and that we can use in our designs. So if we type something here, so we want a uh, cupcake company, which might be uh, the title of some logo that we're going to make, uh, we can search for fonts by choosing, uh, for example, only serif fonts, remove the monospacing, say I want um, a number of styles, like three styles, I close this and I say, okay, I want Roboto Slab, for example. Then I can just select the text here, click here, start typing Roboto space slab, slab, and just press enter. And then we have that font included in our design. Very powerful and very good to know that these are available. Uh, the same goes as we did with the other layers. We can, of course, apply different colors to um, our text. Uh, we can also uh, create a text stroke so outside of the text the default is outside we can create a stroke to sort of fill um, the, all the space around the text now it becomes some very aggressive metal logo maybe we don't want that and we can easily remove the stroke again by pressing the minus button here um, and furthermore, for text, you can, of course, also apply shadows and other things uh, to that as well. So that is, uh, in very short, what the text tool can do for you. So now that we have learned how to make simple shapes, uh, apply some colors, apply some style to it, add text, and work with artboards, we're now going to put this all together and create a very simple mock logo of a supposedly company that we are going to make an app for. Uh, 
So let's hold the uh, space bar and drag, click and drag to uh, a new area over here. We'll press the A button and we're going to create a new artboard that will be square. So we're going to hold the shift key and let's make it about, let's say 450. So on the right side, we can still edit the dimensions of this specific frame. So 450 by 450, you see it automatically adjusts because we have constraint proportions set to on here. So now we have a nicely um, square frame. Let's put something inside. So let's start with an oval, a bit like this, and let's put a little gradient in there. So we're gonna pick a radial gradient and let's go from say a bit pinky to a nice shade of blue and let's make sure that it's fully like this and let's move the center of this ball a bit to the top so now we have sort of a spherical um yeah planet almost kind of thing thing going on here and to add a little bit to that let's get a you know how about we're just going to get a square in there and we're just going to remove part of the circle so we're going to have the square and the circle selected we'll choose the boolean operation uh, options and we'll choose subtract now we'll have the square removed from the circle and as you can see it's slightly not like uh, correct so i'm gonna move this slightly down like this yeah this will do for now and now let's add uh, another circle in uh, below there but make it um, slightly smaller so let's copy and paste this circle and uh, as you can see it's already outside of that boolean operation zone and we're going to hold shift and alt and then click and drag to make it smaller but still have it contain its proportions and staying in the same position so we're going to get this radial gradient again Maybe make everything slightly darker. And click outside of it again. And now we have sort of a, yeah, we're still kind of planet -y. So let's add a little text in there. Um, let's call our planet um, Blob. And let's choose a nice, nice font for that. So I'm just gonna go into fonts.google.com. And we're going to create, you know, I think a nice one would be a sans serif font for display. And I want it to be quite uh, uh, heavy weight. So I'm going to pick uh, the thickness here and say that it should be pretty thick. Yeah. All right. So let's go for real way. Let's take doses. It's kind of nice. It has this comic feel to it. So we'll type here doses and we're going to set it to extra bold and increase the size by a lot of steps by holding shift and pressing up. So now we have a text there that we can put here. And now if we select both circles here and press command G or control G, we'll group it into one group. So we can easily move it around a bit. And let's say we're gonna give this text a bit of an outside stroke that's going to be white because then what we'll have, so let's set it to 20, press enter. And now if we move the text in here, you'll see that it automatically takes out the remaining space for those layers below. So now we have our nice blob logo. What we're going to do now, we're going to export it. So we're going to select everything that we have on the screen here. We're gonna press Command G again in order to group it. And now we have this logo, um, yeah, nicely grouped together. Let's rename it right away. So we'll call it logo Let's rename the frame as well. Let's call it logo frame. And now we're going to export this. So what we'll do, we'll scroll to the bottom of the um, 
uh, settings screen, the property screen here. And as you can see here, there's one uh, button called export. So we'll click export and then we'll choose the size. So if we export this right now, this selected part as a PNG, it will come out with a transparent background color. Uh, we don't want that, we want it to be white. So we're going to select the entire frame, scroll down again, and now we'll see that export, we just clicked it, but now it's gone again. That, that is because this export is uh, used for every single item that you click. So now the export is set for this, only this blob part. So let's remove it here, open the frame again, click on export, choose the size. So we want it one time uh, magnification. So it will come out as a 450 by 450 PNG. Click export and click save. And now we'll have a export of our logo available in our own file system. For this chapter, we will be looking into uh, uh, creating an app from scratch. And if you are creating an app from scratch, it's very important to realize what data you're going to work with. So what is the information that you're trying to transform into something visual? Uh, that is a topic we usually call information architecture. And for the purpose of this yeah, very basic app that we're going to produce, let's just quickly have a look at the information we're going to show on the uh, app before we start actually designing it. So uh, to, in order to do that properly, let's just start a new file for now where we can brainstorm a little bit on what we are going to build. So the idea here is that we're going to build a recipe app. Uh, recipes, as you know, they always have ingredients, they have like a time to cook, an amount of servings and all those sort of things. So let's just write them down quickly. So uh, I choose T to of course start the text tool again. So we have our uh, recipe app and our recipe app will have a list of recipes Uh, next to that, our app will have a detailed screen with the specific recipes that you can see more information about. So we'll have a detailed view of a single recipe. And maybe as a nice touch, we will also have a, a splash screen. And then inside these, uh, all these screens, we will have the recipe in various shapes and forms. And uh, in order to start with like getting a grip on what information we're going to show. So let's just say we're going to give each recipe uh, a name. So it will have a name. Next to that, it will also have a time to cook. That might be very relevant uh, if you need to go out to do an exercise uh, quickly or you don't have a lot of time, then it might be needed to find a recipe that has a short time to cook. And maybe if you have some more time, you want to cook with friends, then you want to find a recipe which has a longer time to cook because it's yeah nice to be around to other people for a while. Uh, and then something else that might be interesting is the amount of servings that the recipe is going to give you like approximately. Um, of course, next to that, it always uh, really creates the appetite if there's a nice picture of food. So let's just add that in there as well. Picture of food. And uh, of course, the recipe also has a long description in terms of instructions what you have to do. Uh, so let's call that instructions. Of course, there is something missing here and that is the ingredients itself. Uh, but for the purpose of this workshop, I will skip the ingredients and just look into these um, items. So let's write down ingredients here. So now we have sort of a very rough uh, and very simple, very basic information architecture of what we're going to create. Um, so let's get started with the actual app. Now we are ready to start creating our first screen. Um, and uh, it might be a good time to start creating a very basic splash screen. So let's uh, start by uh, uh, saving this document for now. Now it's still in your draft. Maybe you already assigned it to a project, but now is a good time to give it a name. So let's give it a name, call it recipe app. Press enter to save it. All right, so let's add our first artboard or frame by pressing the A key on the keyboard and then choosing a form fit that you would like. Uh, I'm going for iPhone 8 right now. And we have our first template here. I will immediately rename this frame into uh, splash screen so I can easily find it later on. 
So what we will put on this back uh, uh, on this splash screen is a uh, uh, of course the text of the app itself, like the uh, the logo. Uh, I thought of some like a uh, nice and uh, semi cheesy name, so let's call it Salt. We'll put a dot behind there for stylization, and let's pick a nice font. So we'll go to fonts at google.com and let's search for a font that has like quite a decent weight so we'll go for certain thickness and let's see Montserrat looks kind of nice it has this sort of recipe vibe over it so let's pick that one increase the font size and set it to bold because we want it to really look nice and um, you'll see now that the text area is slightly larger than the actual text i can simply double click on one of the squares and that allows me to resize it if i double click 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 then it will automatically resize to the size that we need so let's put that in the center of course you can also use the alignment tools and let's draw a nice square around it like this, I'll give it a white background. It will disappear now, of course, in the original background, but the text is still behind there, as you can see in the layer panel here. And now if I select a square and press Command and then um, the left square bracket, it will move back one layer in the layer screen. So I can put it up again and down, and now it's behind that one. And I will select the, um, the text as well. Command G to group it, and here we have our logo. And now for the background, it would be nice if we have some sort of food imagery there. Um, so let's create a rectangle that is completely covering the uh, artboard. You can see that the red lines will automatically help you in uh, aligning it properly. And let's uh, get some image on the background there. Um, and the way we're going to do that is by installing a plugin. We could normally do this by setting... Um, adding a, a fill layer and choosing an image and then choosing an image from our computer to upload. But for this, I will show you a slightly neater trick that is it with a plugin. So we go to the menu, then we go to plugins and we go to manage plugins. A new screen will open where we can find the, uh, the plugins that we can add to Figma. And this is very powerful. We click browse plugins and then we can search. And the thing we're going to search for is Unsplash. It might already appear on the top of your screen, but if it's not, then at least you know how it's called. You simply click install and you have it installed. And if you go back to the tab where we were just now, you'll see that we can now use it. So uh, I'll just remove the large rectangle here, at least the image back, the image layer within that rectangle. And now I will right click the layer, click plugins and choose unsplash. Now a pop-up will appear that is from the plugin itself. And here we can select any type of imagery that we want. So for this one, of course, we want food. So I'll just click food and it will go and look on the uh, uh, Unsplash website and find an image of food. So I can close this and yeah, this is not very much food. It's more like a person with a handbag. This might happen once in a while. You just go through it again, click food. And now we have, this looks kind of nice. We might need to rename the app to Honey now, but that's okay. So we have this layer now. If we uh, move this layer to the back as we did, we did with the logo just now. So make sure we have the layer selected here. Command square bracket and we move it back. And now we have our app uh, splash screen and sort of a logo ready to go. So now we have our splash screen. It's time to look at the overview screen where we're going to have a list of all the recipes. So if we whoop, press space and click and drag in order to go to the right, we can press the A key again, make another iPhone 8 artboard, and let's rename it and call it overview. So we'll have a list of all the recipes there. So the first thing we're going to need to create is a little header on top. So let's create a uh, rectangle that we'll put on the top bar here. Let's make it around 50 points. If it doesn't work out right away, you can always just edit it here. So let's say 50, 
we'll give it a white background and we'll add a little bit of a drop shadow effect right there. If you want to edit this drop shadow effect, you can of course easily change the blur settings, maybe slightly less on the Y setting. And let's make it a bit more light. Oh, I might increase this. So now we have a nice header box there. And now we have to put some text inside in order to show the user that they are inside the Salt app. So let's select this piece of text. And you'll notice that when you're hovering over items that there's a blue box surrounding it. Uh, if you are clicking, you will always select the group containing these items. So if we want to select only the text, we can use the control key or the command key. And if we hold that one, you'll see that a line appears below the word that we have now. Same goes for the rectangle, same goes for the image. So I'll just command click on the word. I'll copy it and I'll paste it here. Of course, it needs to be slightly smaller in size. So let's degree, uh, decrease it and about 22 should be fine. And now let's align it to this one. So let's do the horizontal align and the vertical align. You'll see that now it's being dropped down. Now we can group it again. So we'll call it header and let's align it to the top. Now we have a quite neatly aligned um, header for our app. Now, of course, we need to make the list with the actual recipes inside here. So uh, as we uh, just written down, the recipe consists of a few items, name, time to cook, amount of servings, etc. So let's create that here. I'll just move the text here so we have it nicely legible. So let's first start with the name of the recipe. So let's make a rectangle quite like this size. And let's just put recipe name here. Then we'll create another text layer. Oops. And that layer will contain the time to cook. So let's say it's uh, five to 10 minutes. It's a very fast recipe. And then let's just double click this one again in order to have it on the right size. Do the same thing for the amount of servings. So let's say four people. And oops, I need to resize this one as well. So let's double click and then pull it out so it can still contain a larger text. And now we come to a nice tricky little thing because this five to 10 minutes is a bit vague. Like how is someone going to know that that is the time to cook and not the time to eat or uh, something else. So let's add a nice little icon in the front here. And the nice thing about Figma is that it has built in icons uh, because it has the material icon font. So if we go to material.io slash tools slash icons, you will find a website uh, where you can find all sorts of icons that are default in the material guidelines. So for example, time to cook could be indicated by a clock. Unfortunately, the clock is not there. So maybe we need something like time. Yes. So this word below here is the actual name of that icon. And if we type access underscore time in our Figma, text layer. So I'm going to copy paste this layer, move it slightly to the left and then type access underscore time. And now I select the entire text, go to the uh, font family selection and I will type material icons, press enter. And now you will see we have the icon immediately inside the app, which is I think a great feature. So let's align it a little bit let's copy paste it and move it down in front of the servings. So let's find an icon for the amount of people that you can serve with this. So let's try people. There's actually a nice one just called people. So let's do that. And now that we have this, we can maybe do something about the styling here. So let's 
set this one to the same font we had for our logo. So Montserrat. Let's give it some weight and slightly increase the size to make it more legible. And let's do the same for the fonts here. Choosing the right fonts is always quite difficult. Maybe Montserrat is actually not the best choice here. So let's just go for Open Sans for a bit more legible on smaller sizes. And let's give the icons a different color. So I just selected these two icons. I'm going to here and let's make them slightly grayed out. This would work and increase the size a little bit. I think 16, 16 is about okay. And now let's just group these two items so we have a nice sort of settings list that maybe if we want to expand it later on with more properties. So I'm just gonna shift select the excess time here as well, command G to make it a group. So let's call it a setting and do the same for people and for people group. And let's also call it a setting. Now we can select both and move them around any way we want. And of course, we also said that we wanted to have a nice picture of the actual recipe. And we're going to use the same plugin for that as we made to use the uh, splash screen. But let's first put a nice rectangle around this to make it a real proper list item. Uh, okay, we have that now. Let's make it a white background as well. Add a little shadow effect. I will decrease the uh, color a bit so it's slightly less like in your face type of shadow. And now let's move the layer back notch by notch by notch until it's all the way in the back of the uh, group. Now we're just going to select this, Command G again to make the new group, and let's call it a list item. So now we have the uh, recipe list item. Let's just put an image on top as well. So I'm just gonna move this one slightly up so we have some room here to place the image. I'm gonna create a new rectangle. I'll move it on top there. And I'll, let's do it like this. So now it's approximately, yeah, it's exactly the same size as the rectangle below. And we're gonna use the plugin again. So plugin, unsplash, and then we'll choose food. Hopefully something nice pops up. What is this? Berries or tea? Let's try something else. Pineapples. A piece of pizza. This looks nice. All right. Uh, I know it's only the top of the pizza, huh? but who likes crust and who likes the actual pizza? Anyone uh, uh, of their own. All right, so here now we have our uh, list item and we have a very quick uh, sort of item that we can reuse. Um, oops, we still need to put the rectangle inside the uh, list item. And now we can, of course, copy paste this uh, in order to create our list. So let's do that quickly. As you can see, Figma sometimes helps you by pointing out that you have something uh, positioned in the same dimension opposed from another item. Um, these are all these nice handy little cues that come in handy quite a lot. And let's change the photo here as well. So we'll go to Unsplash again. Choose food. What do we have here now? Spaghetti. And we'll do the same for this one. Choose food. Another spaghetti. Like Italian focused food. Wow, pasta. Okay, this looks good. All right, so that concludes the overview page and we will step into creating components in the next lesson. Let's have a look at components for this lesson. So what we've done previously, we've made a little list in uh, our app and uh, we can easily copy paste these uh, uh, groups, these list items in order to create a longer list. But if we want to change, for example, the font size here, uh, you will notice that it will not increase in the other items. And there's a very nice feature called components within Figma, where you can produce one item and then create instances of that item. 
and still be able to sort of um, edit the styles for the parent component while it also influences all the instances of that component. So let's do that right now. So we're just going to delete the two list items that we created below here. Let's just remove them. I'll move this out of the way a little bit. And let's refactor this into a component. So actually making a component is very simple. As soon as you have an item selected, you can right click and click create component. There's also a short key there if you want to use it. I usually just use the, uh, uh, the right mouse click. And as soon as we create a component, you will see that it now becomes purple. And on the left side, you will see there's this sort of four squares um, that are appearing, uh, which indicates that this is your master component. The master component is sort of the boss and decides what everything else will look like. Now, as soon as I copy paste the master component in order to make uh, extra items in that list, you will see that it looks like it doesn't really appear. I've had this frustration for a while now. Uh, and as you can see, it did actually appear in the layer list. And that's just because it appeared right on top of the original master component. So let's undo that for now. And let's move our master component out of the way, out of the artboard. And let's copy it again, click overview, and then paste it. Now you will see it's immediately nicely visible. And now what we're going to do, we're going to try and change something in the master component. So let's say we want to increase the font size of the uh, servings and the amount of time it takes to prepare it. So let's set it to 13, 14. And as you see, it immediately does the same for um, the instance of that component. Now, if we would have to, if we would be changing the uh, font size of the title inside the instance, and the instance is indicated by this empty uh, tilted square here, you will see that I'm still able to change the font size for this specific layer. If I press enter, it will commit those changes. But the original master component is still the same. Now, if I make another, oops, see, I do it again. Let me just move this one up. So now I'm going to create another instance of this component. Oh, it's slightly down. And let's just change the color of the master component text here and set it to red. A bit brownish, reddish you'll see that it also changes for the both the instances. But if I would change the font size now, it will only change for the instance where it has not yet been overridden. So you can override settings per instance of a component and still keep some other settings more generic. And that is very handy because for us, if we want to have different recipes with different images, we really want to have every recipe with a different image and also a different name. So I'll move this slightly up and go here a bit. So now we have our recipe here. This one still has the longer or like bigger font size text. If we want to reset that to the default values, we can right click on the instance and choose reset instance. Now we're still, uh, or we are again on track with what the master component is telling us how it should look. So let's do some more details here. Let's move this one slightly up. Maybe we want the image to be slightly bigger even. So let's move this one down a bit, give the image a bit more room and make this rectangle slightly bigger. I think this will do. And as you can see, if I now select the instance, because I've resized this one, the original sort of component size is still remembered. And we can fix that by just clicking on the component and then clicking this button, which resizes to fit. And now you'll see that the size is back again and it's back the way it should be. So now we have to create some uh, random text and random images for our recipes that we're going to paste in this area. As you can see, you can also pay, copy paste from an instance of um, a component. So let's select all of these, align them centered quickly, 
and now let's add a different image for every component so we will command click on the um, image that we have here command shift click in order to select multiple of those so you can also make a multi selection within different components and now we will just right click plugins on splash and click food and see what type of Italian food we'll get now. As you can see, food is loaded into uh, every unique uh, recipe. Let's try that one more time. And we have new entries again for every recipe. But as you'll see now, the text is still the same. So we're going to use another plugin in order to also uh, auto generate some text. So we'll go to the menu again, plugins, manage plugins. And then we'll look for the sort of infamous lorem ipsum text that we can have generated. So if you look for lorem ipsum, you'll find this plugin by David Williams and click install. You will have it installed. And what we can do now, we can now select the recipe name We'll do that with Command Shift or Control Shift for the other names as well. Let's right click, plugins, and choose Lorem Ipsum. Now we can choose two types of Lorem Ipsum. We can have it generated from multiple sentences, like have a very long paragraph. But we can also auto generate it to the size of our text frame. And if I do that now, you will see that it is automatically trying to find words that fit. Unfortunately, something is going wrong here. So. Why don't we just manually adjust it here? So now we have recipes with each a unique image and we know how to use these components as well. Working with lists and larger groups of components is a very nice way to quickly create a screen that looks very good. But how do you make sure that they are all aligned in the same way, especially if, if you have a list with uh, more components in a, in a vertical row? So let's have a look at how you can quickly do that. So let's just imagine that we've positioned these items in a sort of vertical list, but they're all not exactly the same aligned. So we're going to click and shift, hold shift, and then select all the different entries. And when you move down into the selection, you will see there is a blue button appearing there. That is called the tidy up button. Now it's for a list that is vertically aligned, but it might also appear as a nine dot sort of button that is for grids for now let's focus on the lists so as soon as we click this you will see that the uh, the spaces between this will be aligned so that they're all the same only the horizontal alignment is not yet similar so for that we just click the center horizontal align and now we have it horizontally centered now if you hoover this like group selection you'll see that there are some lines appearing here as soon as you hoover those there is a uh, dimension shown and that is the dimension that is used for all the spacing between these elements so we can quickly say okay it has to be 20 or for example 15 and if we want to um, uh, for example say oh this uh, recipe should be here actually we can just click this pink circle and drop it right here and that means you can rearrange your entire list very easily and very fast Final page, the detail page for a single recipe. I'm just going to move some things out of the way here. Make sure I deselect them. Otherwise, if I create something new, it will be created inside this component. I'm just going to press the A key. I'm going to select this one first. Press the A key. Add an iPhone 8. And we have a new screen here, so let's rename it to Detail. And now we can add the header on top because we want to have a back button there that allows us to move back into the previous page. And while I've just copy pasted it, um, it just spotted into my mind that I can also create a component out of this header so I can reuse it on all pages. So I'll delete it here and I'll right click the header here, click create component, move it out of the artboard and I'll copy it and paste it back into the artboard here align it to the top and now we have it component uh, inside that overview let's do the same for our detail page 
And because we want to have a back button there, we need to make another uh, text area here that has the material icon for a back button. So let's go to the material icons website, material.io slash icons. And let's look for one with a, let's say is aiming to the left. So let's search for the keyword left. So we have chevron underscore left. So we'll create that one here. So we'll create it inside the component. So I'm use the text tool, type chevron underscore left. Don't worry about the uh, uh, text spacing right now. And choose the material icons. So now we have a back button. Let's double click on the edges to make it nicely formed. And it's aligned to this text right now. And it, if you hold the alt button, you can see the spacing that it has to the sides. So let's say we want the spacing to be similar to what we have on the top. So we need to move it three to the left, one, two, three. And now we have 14, 14 and 14. You will see that it appears on the detail page, but it also appears on the overview page. But since we can overrule one single component instance, let's just command click on this one here, press enter to have the text selectable, and then just press backspace or delete to remove the text. Now click outside of it, and now you will see that we are reusing the same component on these two pages, but we have overridden one single setting. All right, let's move the uh, recipe detail actually in here. Um, so let's take the component that we have here, the top one, we'll use that one for a prototype as well. So we copy it and we paste it into this screen. And now what we're, we're going to do is quite important because we need to keep the naming of all the list entries here in order to create a nice seamless transition later on. So we're just going to keep these names. And what we're going to do, because we're going to slightly change the layout here, because it's not going to be a tile like this, but it's going to be full screen. So we're going to de detach this component instance. So we right click and we choose detach instance. Now we can freely change all the aspects of this uh, item. So let's uh, make it a full width one. And you know what? We will move this whole group one layer back. And then we will make the background color of this instance of the header component. We'll make it slightly transparent with a linear gradient. So we'll have the gradient the transparent side there. Move it slightly down. Yeah, let's see here. I think that will do. All right. And then we can also remove the rectangle that we had behind there, but we're not going to actually remove it. Let's just make it invisible. So we'll choose the uh, um, uh, layer controls and we set it to 0% visibility. And we're going to move this text, this one, this one, this one, and this one slightly down and slightly to the left. And now let's add the actual recipe like instructions in there. Uh, of course, we're not going to type the entire instructions because I don't know, to be honest, how to make Senectus be bendum. Uh, so let's just create a new text area by pressing T. Create a text area that is, it can be quite long, doesn't really matter. And then we'll just right click, plugins, lorem ipsum, Oops, we didn't have our text layer properly selected. So we create a new text layer again. We'll just deselect it for now. Ah, as you can see, the text layer is removed as soon as it's empty. So we'll put a little bit of text inside. We'll deselect it. And then we can right click plugins and choose lorem ipsum. And we're going to auto generate in order to make it fill the entire uh, sheet. Now what you find is that it still had the font of the last text that we selected. That is of course not what we want. So let's set it to open sans, set it to a regular font, and let's tone down the size a little bit. 16, maybe 12. 
Not sure why the font size is not working now. Ah. Sometimes you have to fiddle around a bit in order to make things work. So let's go for 15. And let's also increase the line height a little bit. Sorry, just the paragraph spacing. The line height to increase legibility. All right. And let's just redo the lorem ipsum generate. And now we have our full recipe text. I think I don't like the gradient after all, so I'm just going to set it to a solid white in the end. And let's then just for move this one slightly down so the coffee cup is properly visible. As you can see, the alignment here is still a bit off. And that is because our list item is still within a frame. So let's reframe this one to have it contain everything. And then let's resize our image to be completely on the edge. All right. So there we have it. We have a, a very nice splash screen. We have a, an overview of uh, all the recipes that we have in our app. And then we have a detailed page where someone can look up the exact instructions for that recipe. So for the next lessons, we will look into how we make this an interactive prototype. And I'm looking forward to see you there, Beck. A very powerful feature of Figma is that you can immediately view and uh, interact with the prototypes that you have created. This feature is very easy to use and uh, this lesson will show you how to get there. First, let's do some very basic interactivity. So let's uh, select our splash screen and say that we want our splash screen to move into the next screen, the overview screen. So we'll tap the splash screen and then we will set the prototyping tab over here. So normally it would be on design if you click it and then click the prototyping tab. Now you see that there's a little ball popping up here and we can click and drag this ball to another screen. So just click and drag and when the overview screen is selected, you will just let go. Now we have set our ver very first uh, uh, transition. And if we click the play button on the top right here in Figma, the prototype will load. And this prototype is being displayed within an sort of iPhone mocking uh, simulator to make it look like it is really uh, working on a phone. You will see that the mouse cursor changes into this large ball and we can click. And now it will move to the next screen. But what we want, of course, is it to be uh, maybe automatic since it is a splash screen. So when we have the splash screen selected, we can change the interaction settings here. So now it's an on tap. So as soon as I click or touch my finger, uh, it would move. But let's say we want to do this after a short delay. So let's say we want to do this after 1500 milliseconds. We want it to navigate to the overview page. And we want this to be a dissolving matter. So it slowly fades into the new screen. We'll choose the ease in and ease out. And we'll make it, say, a full second. So 1000 milliseconds, which is okay for now just to see how it works. So now if we would restart the entire uh, prototyping uh, 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 screen, we can press the R button on our screen, as noticed here in the in the bottom right. And now after the defined milliseconds, you will see the transition to the uh, list page. Now what we can do is add um, an interaction to go from our list overview to the detail page. And of course we can drag this ball again, but we're not going to do that because we don't want people to be able to click anywhere on the screen and go to this one. No, we want people to be specifically clicking on a single recipe in order to go to the next screen. Now the tricky part here is that we have already started using components and I will just go through it and uh, then in the end I will change some things just to let you know how this works. So let's define all these interactions to go to the next page. And if you deselect, then you will see the little arrows uh, pointing to the next page. So you, go, you can also see where the interactions come from. Now, if we restart our demo again, we'll see that first smooth transition to the list page. And now if we click anywhere outside of the screen, you will see the tappable areas lighting up in blue. 
So I can now click this one, and now I will be coming. Uh, I'll, I'll be moving to that uh, detail screen. I can just press the left arrow on my keyboard to go back. Try the next one. Try the next one. As you can see, they all work, but they do not show the specific recipe. That is because the page in our uh, design is only designed like this, so only with this specific image. That is something to keep in mind when you are designing things. But also, now we have to specifically uh, make these interactions work for all these separate components. And since we are using a single component, we can also define that animation once and then uh, use it on all our components. So let's do that. So I'm going to remove all these interactions that we have now. You can just click the ball, click and drag. You see a small cross appearing. Then you can let go and then it is removed. So we're going to select our master component, click and drag, move it into the detail page. We're going to uh, shortly uh, uh, change some animations here. Uh, let's just set it to instant. Actually, this is fine. And now if we select our components, you would have expected that the uh, transition line would be there, but it's not there yet. And that is because we have overridden these com component instances with our own settings. We've already added an image of our own uh, and some text. So we need to reset our instances. So let's quickly select all our instances, right click and choose reset instance. We will lose our images that we had before. That's okay for now. So let's just uh, quickly redo our images, plugins, unsplash, let's add some new food. All right. And let's add some new recipe names as well while we're at it. So let's use the Lorem Ipsum plugin, auto generate. All right. So now we have some new recipes. So as you can see now, because we set this interaction on the component, it will automatically appear for all our component instances. So now if we go to our page again, we can use it, press the left arrow to go back on all the different component parts. So let's do the same for the back button. And the back button is something special because if we are on the detail page, we want the user to be able to go back to the previous list. Um, and we, what we can do, we can uh, move it, of course, the ball to this page. But maybe we want to use this header in uh, different screens as well. So we're going to use a different technique here. We're going to uh, click and drag on the arrow and then move it to this blue back button that is over here. And that indicates that it will always go back to the previous page where that um, uh, new one came from. It is automatically applied to our component since we did not override any settings on this component. So now we can really navigate through our app. We can use the back button. And we have some very basic but very nice navigation elements implemented in our prototype. Just by now, there are some lists within our pages that have more text than we can actually see within our demo. So it would be very nice if we could scroll all the way down here. And same goes for the previous page if there would be more items that we can click upon. So let's work on that. So for now, let's go into the design mode. And we have our items here. And we're just going to create some new instances of that by just, you know what, I'm just going to copy paste all of these and position them below the other ones. And just have to make sure that they are within our overview artboard. And as you can see right now, they are outside of it. So I'm just going to move them within the artboard so I can click and drag and there's a big black line popping up there and I can just put them inside the artboard. So now they are inside the artboard. I make sure that I select all of them and now I can do the click the tidy up button again to make sure that they all have the same alignment in between them. You can also set the alignment here. So let's increase it a bit. Let's say it's 20. Now we have our list, which is longer. And if we go back to the demo page, you'll see that we can still not scroll this. That is because there is a specific setting that allows you to over, over 
uh, um, when there's overflow on the page that it allows for scrolling. So if we go into the prototyping tab, we'll see a setting here called overflow behavior. If we set this to vertical scrolling and go back to our demo, you'll see that we can now scroll until we reach the bottom of our list. One thing that you might notice already is that our header is still moving with us as well. And maybe we want our header to be on top of this list. So in order to do that, we go back into the design tab. We click our header and then we set it to fixed position when scrolling. So this object will always be in the same place when scrolling the prototype. So let's just set that. And as you set this, you will see that on the left side within your overview artboard, there is a new sort of subcategory called fixed. So everything within that subcategory will be fixed when scrolling. So if we go back to our page now, you'll see that it nicely sticks into place and we can scroll through all our recipes. We can do exactly the same for our detail page. So if we select that, select the text that we have, we'll see that it is overflowing the page. So let's first do the um, set the fixed position for our header. And now select the entire artboard prototype scrolling, vertical scrolling. And now if we go into the detail page, you'll see that we can scroll and the uh, header stays in the same position. So our project becomes slightly more lively with every addition that we make by now. Now let's finalize our prototype with a nice new recently added feature to Figma, which is called Auto Animate. Uh, this animation feature allows transition between the properties of two shapes. Uh, and these shapes have to be, uh, they have to have the same name. Uh, so let's have a look at how we're going to organize that. So first thing we have to do is we have to make sure that our component and the animation type will be set to Smart Animate. Let's just set it to uh, 500 for now in order to see it properly. And now if we would click on our uh, item here, you will see that it fades into this new item. There is, however, one problem here, and that is you'll see that the animation is now coming from the middle. And that is sort of annoying. So the way to fix that is to make sure that the layer name that you click upon is going to be exactly mimicked within our um, like final component or final artboard. So in order to arrange that, let's just rename this one to list item animate. And let's do the same for the top one here. List item animate. Now, if we would click this one, you'll see that it morphs from the top. And if we would select this one, it's also going to move from the top because that is the one that it's going to find. So that is in short how you use the Smart Animate. It really makes your prototype look very cool. And if we would tone down on the animation speed a bit, so let's say we make it 100, it looks very fluid and very cool. So now we've made our app. We have an app with a splash screen that fades into an overview. That overview is very nicely scrollable and it allows us to select a single item and look at the details of that page. We can also scroll through the detail page and we can go back to the previous page by clicking here and just looking at a different recipe if we want. And that concludes these, uh, these tutorials. Uh, I hope you had a great time. And if you have any more questions or feedback, feel free to uh, uh, send me a message or leave something in the comments. I hope to see you around sometime.